Coming up next on Passion Struck. Recent research in neuropsychology has really been showing that we do have a set of internally rewarding experiences that are behind a lot of our activities. When people are doing something benevolent, when they're doing kind things for other people, they're also feeling striatal activation. They're showing activation in the reward centers of their brain because something satisfying has occurred for them. I think in this way, it's very much supported the general tenets of self-determination theory. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles, and on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. It is such an incredible honor today to welcome Dr. Richard Ryan to passion struck. Welcome, Richard. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me today. Well, you're so welcome. And I cannot wait to dive into self-determination theory in more detail, but I want to give the audience some background. So you originally met Edward DC when you were a graduate student. And if I understand it correctly. At the time the two of you met, you were studying how people handle change. What brought the two of you together to start studying human motivation and wellness? The, the two of us met, we were actually doing some clinical work together uh, using Gestalt therapy techniques. So we had some discussions about his work on intrinsic motivation and its connections with just the general ideas about human autonomy, which was an area of interest to me. And I think we just saw that we had some common thinking and we thought that the phenomena of intrinsic motivation that he was exploring was a way into understanding that people are pretty active. People can make a change in their world and then there are certain environments in which that's more likely to happen than others. And we wanted to study that. Since you brought up intrinsic motivation, when I think of the study of motivation and that specifically, I can't help but thinking of the two of you. If the audience doesn't know about the two, you guys have hundreds of thousands of citations to your credit, not to mention hundreds of articles and books, and now through organization that you've developed even more beyond you. Did you ever think that when you started this, you would be known as one of the world's top 25 scientists? No, that certainly wasn't an intention behind any of the work. I do think that both Ed and I back in the, in the, they have to understand this in the historical context of the late 70s, early 80s, that we thought there needed to be another point of view besides the dominant behavioral and cognitive behavioral view at the time in which people were pawns to the environment or you manipulate the environment to manipulate people's behavior. But instead, we were interested in kind of the internal drivers of behavior, the things that people are really after when they're passionate about something, when they're engaged in something. What are the things that have people sustain their engagement over time in, in activities? Those were the kind of things that interested us, not how you could reward or punish people to do certain things, which was a dominant uh, uh, paradigm at the time. And the two of you came out with a book in 1985 titled Intrinsic Motivation and Self-Determination in Human Behavior. And you highlighted in it the importance of high quality motivation and enhancing an individual's experience and performance. And I liken it to just like our body needs nutrients like oxygen and clean water to stay healthy. Self-determination theory says we also have to have basic psychological needs that have to be met for our mental health and well-being. Yeah. Can you explain the three core tenets of autonomy, feeling competent and being connected with others and why that's so important to mental health? and happiness? Well, John, I like the way you begin with the metaphor of there are some kind of nutrients that we need in order to be able to flourish. And certainly that we have physical nutrients, vitamins, other kinds of things. But it, psychologically, people are at their best in environments where they can get certain psychological needs satisfied. And one of them is the need for competence. We, we're never really motivated in an environment where we feel overwhelmed by the challenges that are there or where we feel like we don't know what to do next, uh, where we don't have a structure or we don't have the skills to negotiate the environment. Motivation 
dies directly. And that's been at the center of many theories of motivation. But more than that, we also need to feel that what we're doing is something that we can authentically stand behind, that we endorse, that we want to be engaged. The more we have that volition and sense of willingness to do something, the more we put our whole spirits into what we're doing, the more we're wholeheartedly engaged in an activity. And that's a secret of self-determination. Why it's really important is because when you have that sense of autonomy in your activities, you engage in a way that's more fully satisfying is also higher quality performance. And I think we just add another thing, which is I think we all flourish better in environments where we feel interpersonally supported and have some sense of relatedness with others. If you don't have a sense of belonging or mattering or being included in what's going on, it's really hard to get grounded in a sense of purpose and of why you're there. So really, these things are synergistic, that sense of competence, that sense of autonomy, that sense of relatedness, they're all really important in people being really satisfied in what they're doing and then doing it at their best. Well, thank you for explaining that. And I'm going to go through another 101 topic, and that is in self-determination theory, you describe a continuum of motivations ranging from intrinsic to extrinsic. And for the sake of the listener, can you elaborate on how these different types of motivations can lead individuals to act and the distinct implications each has for our performance? Um, sure. Um, you know, when, when you think about motivation, a lot of people think about motivation as uh, an all or nothing thing. You have a lot of motivation or you have just a little. But I think a distinction we would make in self-determination theory is that it really matters what's motivating you or why you're doing what you're doing. You can be highly motivated because external pressures are on you. And you, we, you know, we can see that could be a pretty powerful motivation. But if you're acting only out of external pressures, then as soon as those pressures goes away, so does your motivation. In other words, the motivation is dependent upon your responding to these external pressures. And so it's not a sustainable kind of motivation unless the environment keeps pressuring and pressuring, of course, and then you get worn out and burned out. Another kind of motivation is interjection when you're trying to please the other people around you or live up to some kind of really strongly, rigidly internalized standard that you have. This, too, is a pretty big driving force for people. I want to you know, make my father proud of me or I want to do the things that will impress my boss. If this is what's motivating you, it can also be a high driving force, but also you're really susceptible to uh, being off courses on the things that are authentic to you. It's also can be highly conflictual because that may not be something that fits with your own values. And you're also dependent upon that approval being there. And when it's not, motivation can really flag. More sustainable is motivation that comes because you really value what you're doing and you understand the purpose behind it. So uh, that sense of value in our activities is really important to what we call autonomous motivation, a willing engagement in what you're doing. And another form of autonomous motivation is what we already talked about, John, is intrinsic motivation when you're doing it just because you also enjoy the activity itself. People are most, the highest quality motivation really comes out of these last two things, doing something because you have a sense of purpose and value in it and doing something because you have interest in it. These things really are what we want to cultivate in a workplace or in a classroom or on a sport field or anywhere else that uh, we're trying to um, foster motivation in, in people. Well, in my own journey, it was interesting because I ended up going to the Naval Academy and coming out of that uh, served in the military. And I was very much inundated with the latter two, the feeling mm -hmm. that what we were doing, there yeah. was a purpose to the activities that we were doing. And also uh, that you, through your inherent worth and in serving with others, had a, a desire to, to show up at work, a desire to help people when we got deployed. I really like the way you say that. And it's important, I think, for people to understand that autonomy is not about doing whatever you want. It's about doing something that you highly value, something that you stand behind. And it sounds like your service was like that. You really felt like what you were engaged in was something of worth. And that's highly motivating. It was. And so it was very interesting for me. And I'm sure veterans and other people probably feel the same way. When I went into the corporate world, it was almost 180 degree difference. What I found was that we were being rewarded for was getting to the next level or getting a bonus or achieving this title or doing this uh, project so the company could make more money. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a difference for me. I felt like a fish out of water for a while. And my question to you is that in many ways, some of this has changed, but a lot of it remains the same. Do you have a good feeling? 
for why there's so much disengagement across the workplace today? In what you were just describing, the, the reasons that people can be really passionate and engaged in work is because they're finding intrinsic satisfactions in their job. They're finding a sense of purpose. They're finding interest and value in it. But a lot of times, I think organizations lose the thread on that. They try and motivate through external incentives. They're organized around a bottom line formulation, which crowds out a consideration of those intrinsic satisfactions of the employee in their workplace. Some workplaces are, as you say, are really good at creating a climate where people can feel that sense of autonomy over their work and interest in what they're doing. But others uh, create an environment in which people feel controlled on a regular basis, feel don't have that overall sense of purpose, don't see what the company's doing that's serving a larger good. And, and that really undermines that engagement at work. Yeah, I remember I've told this story before, but it's been a while. Uh, when I took my first job at Lowe's, I was hired in as a vice president to take over this function over infrastructure and operations. And uh -huh. I remember about the first week into it, I met with the head of HR and she sits me down and she goes, I just want you to understand where your group lies. And she goes, we recently did an employee engagement survey. And out of, you think, 1,800 stores, all the distribution centers, corporate functions, probably 2,500, 2,700 departments across the company, mm -hmm. uh, we were second last in employee engagement. Cool. So I go out and as anyone would do, I start talking to the customers of the group and everyone's saying, your group is the worst. No one's got any motivation. They don't do anything, et cetera. But then I started to spend time with the people. And I remember I'd go in to the people who were on the call center and the operations center in the middle of the night. I'd talk to everyone from the person working on the data center floor to directors in the organization. And I came to a startling realization that I'd say only about 10% of the employees knew why what they were even doing mattered in yeah. any shape or form. And none of them really understood how their jobs impacted the corporate strategy in any way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is something that's common? I think that's really common. I think understanding what your the role you play and the significance and why your role matters is really a helpful thing in terms of people finding engagement and work. When you can see the place that your contribution makes in the overall success of a corporation, you can feel some ownership of that and feel some part of that larger endeavor. And I don't think that it's communicated enough. And this is not just true in organizations, by the way. Think of the number of classrooms where students aren't told why they have to learn something or why something might be important to learn, but nonetheless, they're told to learn it. It's a similar thing as in a corporation where you're told to do something, but you don't really understand how it fits in with the overall purpose. That sense of a rationale for why we're doing what we're doing is part of what allows us to willingly engage in something. And without a rationale, none of us really can have that sense of authenticity and intentionality in what we're doing. Thank you for bringing that up. And I wanted to take this just one layer deeper. And that is many of the theories of motivation that I was brought up in emphasize the quantity of motivation. And you found that the qualitative differences also matter. Mm -hmm. So the theory I'm most used to using for my corporate days was goal setting theory. Mm -hmm. Can you go through how self-determination theory kind of complements that, but is different from goal setting theory? Well, goal setting theory is really related to self-efficacy theory and the idea in goal setting theories, if you can set really challenging goals, that people will be motivated to achieve them. And I think as a general proposition, that's true. But then we have to say, well, what goals and set by whom? And if I have goals that, again, I can endorse, that I understand the reason behind them, I understand the purpose that I'm engaging in those goals, that's really going to help me fully put my heart into those goals. But if I'm just setting goals because they've been externally mandated, they've been externally Externally set, I don't really understand the purpose of it, then even if they're challenging goals, that's not enough. So self-determination theory would say you it's not just the setting of goals or the level of goals, it's also the reasons behind the goals. And in fact, the reasons behind the goals will probably have more predictive value than just the level of challenge set. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Just setting a goal for the goal's sake is mm -hmm. irrelevant unless you really have a basis for why you need to do it in the first place. 
Exactly. Yes. Goals are useful because they allow us to have a benchmarks and feedback and have a sense of progress. So they have a place in motivation. I don't want to deny that, but they have to be set in the context of what's behind a person's motivation or what's driving the activity itself. And a goal setting is just a piece of that action. So there has have been a lot of books now written on habits, whether it was B.J. Fogg's original works on this to Charles to more recently James Clear. How do you find self-determination theory interplays with habit formation and a habit loop? Well, we make a distinction in self-determination theory between behaviors that are automatic for us and those that, and among those, which ones are really ones that we would want to retain and which ones are ones we wouldn't. You know, we might have some habits that when we reflectively look at the movement, we say, well, I wish I didn't have that habit. It's a problem and it's in my way. And then, of course, we have to then agentically engage in the things that would have us break that habit. But we have a lot of habits, too, that when we reflect on them, we say, I'm glad I have that habit. I'm just going to give a prime example. If I have, if I drive a standard car, which is pretty rare, but I like a standard car, if you're driving and you hear the hum of an engine, you automatically shift the gear in the car. It's a habit, but it's one that you would say, yeah, I, I'm glad I have that habit. I'm glad I'm attuned to that. So habits are something that might be something that's actually well integrated into us and reflect that, that uh, just smooth functioning. We don't want to have everything be in consciousness all the time. But sometimes a habit can be something that reflectively we don't want, and then we can take action to undo that habit. Now, I'm going to take this a little bit further. Sure. As you and I were getting on the podcast today, I told you that one of the the most fundamental issues I think that's plaguing the world today is an existential lack of significance or meaning. Mm -hmm. People just don't feel like they exist in the world. And I recently have been looking at a lot of the research that Gordon Flett has been doing on antimattering. Considering the principles of SDT, can you elaborate on this significance of feeling valued and having a sense of mattering, especially as it relates to our overall well-being and how engaged we are with our lives? Sure. I think SDT says that we are built to seek out and be happy with certain satisfactions. So satisfactions of feeling competent in what we're doing, satisfactions in feeling connected with other people, and satisfactions in doing things that feel authentic and real to us. When we have those things happening, when we have that sense of connectedness with other people, when we feel like we're doing things that are using our abilities, I think this is a deep sense of satisfaction. And it's really all that we need. And I want to say something about Matt. Mattering is not about being famous. It's not about having a worldwide impact. It's about having in your immediate environment the capacity to feel love, the capacity to grow, the capacity to learn, the capacity to do things that you value just in one's own environment. And I think when you have that, then you have a, a deep sense of embeddedness and a deep sense of meaning. I think when you don't have those things, then you can have a sense of being unanchored in the world and alienated in the world and lost in the world in ways that you described. And I think there's a lot of that today. You know, I don't think you can find the kind of authentic satisfaction outside of real human relationships. And I think it's important that we see that they're often right in front of us. I was so glad that this past year, Bob Waldinger came out with his book, The Good Life, because I I think it was a great time for the world to understand that Harvard uh, study at a, on advanced aging and that importance of relationships and what we do. So mm -hmm. thanks for, for bringing that angle up. I wanted to explore this a little bit more through a number of things that are happening in the world today. One of the big things that people are exposed to is social media. And I have a 19-year-old and a 25-year-old, and I always worry about how they're being influenced mm -hmm. as they're growing up by... What I see on social media is people not trying to live up to being what I would call an everyday hero, someone who is serving humanity, trying to make it better. They're trying, it seems like we're trying to emulate these super influencers. Yeah. yeah what yeah. bearing do you think that has on what's happening to people and how can people use SDT to try to combat that? Well, I mean, first, social media writ large is just the environment in which all of us exist these days. If you're in the modern world, you're in an environment where you're exposed to a lot of social media. And then there is a generational effect here. We were just finishing a study that showed that in terms of uh, social media, of course, the, the Gen Z has the highest usage of social media. So they're the most exposed to it. I think it's important to say that screen time was highest in boomers. 
So that probably suggests that they watch more TV, but and I'm not sure which is a worse influence on the, on the world. <laughs> <laughs> but the social media, when the, the large studies on social media haven't really shown that there's some general main effect where exposure to social media is somehow bad for people. I don't think it's that so much. It can be polarizing. And I do think we have a lot of these figures that, as you say, are not trying to be everyday heroes, but are trying to just draw attention to themselves. And I think social media is a magnet for those kinds of personalities. And when you're engaged, you're seeing kind of the extremes of of humanity. And of course, a big mistake can be because that's actually humanity out there as opposed to, you know, a caricature of it that we're doing to track clicks. I totally see where you're coming from. I think a bigger issue that's facing us is what is going to happen with the evolution of AI, mm -hmm. robotics, et cetera. And about eight years ago, before I even went down this path of creating Passion Struck, I was working in a startup called uh, Picket Fence. And we were trying to disrupt the real estate industry. And the company was a little bit ahead of its time for what technology could do at that time. But what we were really trying to do was replace the realtor with yeah. AI. And mm -hmm. it wasn't so much that the technology couldn't do it. It was that the user interface wasn't at that point available in a way that people would feel comfortable dealing with completely AI versus having a real person to work with. It's interesting because when I think of that, I do think that this is an industry that's going to get completely disrupted. When I have looked at the business case for companies like Uber, their whole business model is predicated someday on not having a human being in the car driving it. It's based yep. on autonomous drivers. And so when I see these studies saying that three to 400 million jobs are going to change over the next decade, it's really scary. And it can cause people to have really deep feelings of how can I be intrinsically motivated at all when I have no control over my future? Yeah. What would be some of your advice to people who are going to be experiencing this in the future, which literally is, is most of us? First, I agree with your assessment of the capacities of AI to take over a lot of jobs that we have. And in, in a way, I think that the industries are designing things in a way that's going to be even more possible. And Uber is a good example of it, but there's but there's just lots of examples. Even a lot of the academic work that somebody like me can do, AI can do very well. <laughs> one of the th other pieces that you raise is uh, one of the limitations AI in the past was its uh, lack of capacity to interact in a human way with people, to really be responsive to the things that human wants. But AI shows itself to be increasingly trainable, to have a kind of interaction that uh, even can do things like support autonomy, support competence, and support relatedness. And kind of a lot of the work that I've been asked to do recently is to been to evaluate AI systems in terms of how what are the characteristics they're bringing to the interactions they have with humans in the service of really increasing their engagement and their capacity to do these jobs. We are handing a lot of, I guess you could say, a human work over to AI. The history of humanity has been one of handing over work to machines and then picking up new forms of work, hopefully that are important ones. Do people have no control over their future? I do think there's a lot of people who have to look ahead in their own profession and see what the implications of AI are, but we, we can't really get away from the fact that this progress is gonna be there and that's gonna be a part. One of the things that I, I think about is that uh, as a society, if we increasingly are able to offload all these uh, tasks, is that demand some kind of reorganization in the way we think about labor and hours per week? For instance, we know that a four-day week is better for people's mental health, physical health. It's even better for the economy. It's even better for people's productivity. Maybe we can begin to take advantage of some of these technological advancements to improve the human condition, which after all, they should be doing. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the stuff that I've looked at from the Kauffman Institute, Bookings, Gartner, others, when you look at their graphs, they show this curve that's going to the extreme over the past 30, 40 years of members of the population who have joined companies that they consider large. So these are 250 or more employees. Now, obviously, companies like Amazon, Lowe's, et cetera, will have hundreds of yeah. thousands of employees. But what's interesting is during that same time period, the 
number of small businesses and entrepreneurs has gone down almost in a reciprocal amount, which to me is really showcasing this disintegration that we've had of the middle class and many Western cultures. Yeah. And where I'm going with this is when I'm talking to my kids about where I'm telling them to focus in the future, I am telling them that in this new world where you're going to have technology hitting you, you're going to have these jobs being replaced, there are a couple things for you to consider. And one of those is to take control of your own path, as you were saying. Ultimately, we are built here to learn. We need to constantly be learning, and that's something that they need yeah. to be focused on. But more important than that, I tell them that one thing that AI is not going to be able to replace is how to be curious, creative, and your overall productivity. And then on top of that, emotions like kindness, being compassionate, gratitude. How do you think people should start thinking about those things? Because if we ever allow AI to replace our creativity and our emotions, that's to me when things get really scary. Do you think I'm on the right path here? Of telling well, you know, I, I have a lot of reactions to the things you're saying, John, but one just uh, brings me to some of the work we've been doing recently with nurses and medical professionals and the high rates of burnout that they're experiencing. When you talk to people in those professions, one of the reasons that they're in those professions is because there are places where you can be really human, where you can help other people, where you can have that sense of purpose and kindness for other things. And increasingly, the more corporatized the medical profession has become and hospitals have become, the more uh, there's, we see understaffing, we see profit taking at the cost of the people's ability to give the kind of care that's itself satisfying. So I'm just coming back to there are some professions that are inherently human professions where, you know, we really need to have that compassion for other people and where we get satisfaction from that compassion. And I think what I hope is that we start to value those a lot more as a society and start to reward those positions accordingly. And I don't mean just reward them financially with higher salaries, I create conditions under which people can really experience the satisfactions those professions should have in them, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a caregiver in a home for aging people, you want to be able to experience the satisfactions of caregiving. And that means that you need to have the context and the circumstances of it. So I hope as we free up resources with AI from some kinds of tasks in those organizations, we start to dedicate some of those resources towards creating better human environments. Because we, we value those across societies. No matter who you are, whether you're rich or poor, you want nurses to be attentive to you when you get into the hospital. Whether you're rich or poor, you want to be in cared for in emergency situations. So there's all kinds of situations where it matters to everybody that we take care of our human caregivers. No, I'm so glad you brought that up because my fiance is a nurse practitioner and her specialty is primary care. Mm -hmm. And for a while she was doing that, but in the clinic, she was working in because of the small amount of money that insurance gives these offices to do physicals, right. they have to do dozens and dozens a day. So her typical patient load was somewhere between 20 on a good day, 30 on a, a really hectic day. So when you boil that down, they're really spending about 15 minutes per patient. And for yeah. her, it just gave her this strong sense that she wasn't really serving her patients because That's you really have two options. Either you're sitting in front of a patient typing on your computer because you're trying to get all the notes into the chart, or yeah. if you're someone who's conscientious about it, you're taking the time to be with the patient as much as you can, and then they're having to do all the charting after their actual day is done, which yeah. is what happened to her. So she yeah. found herself working 15, 16 hour days and just never getting a break. And so it just accumulated. So completely yeah. agree that environment plays such a huge role. In yeah, yeah. And it brings us back to some of where we started our conversation, which is that what motivates people most of the time in workplaces is a sense of purpose and being able to use the abilities they have towards some end that they can endorse. And, and when corporations and when bureaucracies crowd out those satisfactions, they crowd out motivation as well. And that, that's why we see the high attrition rates in professions like teaching, professions like nursing, professions like medicine, because we were crowding out those satisfactions. 
I'm going to change directions on you a little bit. One of the favorite episodes that I've done on the show is I interviewed my friend, Dr. Jay Lombard, who is a neurologist. And he wrote this great book, The Mind of God. And what drove him to write it was he specializes in treating patients with ALS and trying to find a cure. But he said when he first started using fMRI, to him was finally looking into the soul, he would say, of a person. And I wanted to ask you, has MRI and fMRI substantiated and expanded your understanding of SDT? Yeah, it has in some ways. I, when I think about uh, looking at activation sites in the brain, I don't really think of looking you know, deeply into the soul of people. I think of looking at the mechanisms through which the soul is operating. I guess I would put it a little bit differently. And I think, for instance, we know a lot when people are engaged in uh, activities willingly and with autonomy, they tend to be more activated in certain areas of the brain, like the medial prefrontal cortical areas. Uh, are more engaged when we're doing something that is intrinsically motivated. We have more activation on the lateral prefrontal cortical area. So one of the beautiful things about and other uh, scanning techniques is it allows us to refine our hypotheses and, and also verify if we think certain conditions are activating intrinsic motivation. We don't only have to look at it behaviorally, but we can also look at it neuropsychologically. I think as a set of methods, it's really been helpful in like, deepening the science of intrinsic motivation and self-determination. Do you think it's validated some of the work that you've done as well? Yeah, I do. I do. For instance, there's been some really good experiments on the undermining effect of rewards on intrinsic motivation. So you know, if you look at the reward uh, areas of the brain, which is a primitive way of putting at it, but th those get activated whenever you get rewarded for doing an activity. But they're also activated when you're just doing something because it's interesting, because things are internally rewarding. And so some of the research uh, especially more recent research in neuropsychology has really been showing that we do have a set of internally rewarding experiences that are behind a lot of our activities. When people are doing something benevolent, when they're doing kind things for other people, they're also feeling a striatal activation. They're showing activation in the reward centers of their brain because something satisfying has occurred for them. But I think in this way, it's, it's very much supported the general tenets of self-determination theory. And that's what some of my research showed is that it actually was uh, validating uh, some of the findings, which is yeah. great to hear. Yeah. And I want to go back to this conscious and non-conscious motives. I have my own book coming out here in February. In one of the chapters, I go through what I call is the pinball life. And I make this assertion that so many of us are on autopilot or mm -hmm. automicity, where we're like a pinball and we're just bouncing off everything mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. And it takes real I have focus. many days like that, John. I have many days like <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, we all do. It's yeah. how do you get that focus and sustain it? It's how do you get into that flow state uh, and stay there for a longer period of time? My question for you is when people, I happen to interview Michelle Seeger, who you might know. She's at the University of Michigan yep. and is a member of your center as, as well. We had a really great talk about her book, The Joy Choice, but what it fundamentally came down to was the power of micro choices in our lives. And that mm -hmm. when we get into this autopilot mode, it's how do you get back into consciousness so that the micro choices that you're making are ones that are leading you more towards your intrinsic drivers and ultimately your life goals. Have you studied micro choices and what emphasis do you put on them? Well, I haven't studied micro choices in particular, although I do, I'm aware of her book. And I also think that it, I think those things do matter a lot. I think the place that we have the big interface with SDT is about the work on mindfulness and being aware of what it is that you're up to. So you described a life of pinball where you're just reacting to everything going on around. And of course, that chain will be uninterrupted unless you step outside of the pinball machine and reflectively look at what's going on. And, and when we think about that, we think about that as an open, receptive, awareness of what's occurring. Now, people use the term mindfulness to describe that. We measure mindfulness and we show that it's deeply related to having more autonomy in life. If you can be take that reflective stance with respect to things, it gives you the space to make better choices moment to moment. So when we get down to those micro choices, really the more we can bring awareness to them, the more we're going to make the ones that are the most fitting 
with our own values and with our own interests. And we're going to reject the ones that are less fitting. So without that mindfulness, we're just pinballs reacting to things around us. And so we think uh, stepping back that uh, engaging in awareness, especially periodically, reflecting on those choices is really important to self-regulation. I couldn't agree more. And it's a big part of what we try to, to teach on this podcast and many of the behavior scientists that I've brought on the show to reinforce that. There's another principle within SDT that I think also applies here. So we talk about the role of mindfulness in self-regulation, but also uh, what we, and this is going to be jargony again, but I, so I'm sorry, because that's you know the way our science sadly operates, but we call it integrative emotion regulation. And that simply means when you're having strong feelings about something positive or negative, that's a cue to step back and pay attention to them. See, what are they telling us? Not to jump in and be controlled by them, but rather to be able to say, oh, my emotions are strong here. They're giving me a message. Let me think about that or receive what that is. So taking interest, we call it interest taking sometimes in emotions as they arise, helps you integrate those and make better choices with respect to them. So mindfulness is particularly important in a moment where there's strong feelings. And that's when you would take interest in that and be informed by them. A lot of I, people think about emotion regulation as tampening down your emotions and how we think in SDT now it's more about listening to them more about knowing what are they trying to tell you and then making choices with that in mind well thank you for sharing that and uh, you probably didn't know this about me but I actually have spent a lot of time in Australia I used to Is work for right? a company there called Lendlease and so uh -huh. we and used to be right in, in Australia uh, Sydney so oh, we used Sydney. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we used to be right there in the heart of it all. You're probably familiar with the round building right in the heart of Sydney. That used to be our headquarters. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Right down in the Central Business District. That's great. Yeah. Sydney's a great city. I've loved um, spending time there. And uh, the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education, where I am, just has a lot of great scholars. So I've been able to learn from some really great thinkers around me. And uh, there's pretty high standard for the scholarship there. So it's been a po very positive change for me to go there. That's what I was wanting to understand more about with some of the things that you're studying now. Mm -hmm. Well, the self-determination theory has a lot of different applications, and then there's both basic research and then those the applied studies that we do with it. So some of what we're doing is looking really at some of the things like you were talking about before, the neuropsychology of motivational processes in the brain. So really at that micro level, but really all the way up to how are different societies better at supporting their citizens' basic psychological needs than others. Why is well-being higher, for instance, in uh, Finland than it is in, say, the United States? Or why is it higher in, in Germany than it is in Ghana? Now, these are questions that we can ask from self-determination theory standpoint of what are the societal mechanisms through which people's basic needs, and including their psychological needs, get fulfilled. So that's at the macro level and then pretty much everything in between. Um, a lot of our work recently is is uh, grant work recently is focused on caregivers for the elderly. So we know that's a high risk population. There's a lot of uh, attrition in that population. So we want to look at what are the conditions of their work and how can we improve them to have them more uh, engaged in providing higher quality care. So you can see that there's an applied thing and then there's things that are also basic research. So we're, we're all over the place. No, it's so interesting. I recently did a solo episode on the Finnish concept of SISU, if you're familiar nice. with that. Yes. And as I was researching it and going down the rabbit hole, it's so interesting how in Finnish society, they base their whole education system on the core tenets of SISU and how different that is and how we in America are teaching our kids because they're really trying to emphasize life skills almost from mm -hmm. the time these kids are out of diapers and really this need for, I don't know, it's like super resilient, super grit mm -hmm. and how foundational that is to overcoming obstacles as you live through the brutality of life. So yeah. I can't wait to hear more about those studies. Yeah. Well, Richard, you've now been doing this for decades. Where do you hope Thank to see- Thank you, John, for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, many decades. It's true. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. Oh, no. And it's incredible to see where it's going. When I started going through the list of scientists around the world who are now part of your institute, it, I, it was like a laundry list of people I want to interview. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly, it just shows you how much your theory has taken off. Mm -hmm. Where do you hope to see this go in, in decades to come? Well, first, one of the important things is I don't think it's my theory or it's not Ed DC's theory. It's really self-determination theory. And at this point, it's really co-owned by quite a community of scientists. We have our triannual meetings and there's 800 people who showed up at the last meeting from 40 countries uh, around the world. There's a larger network than that. So these are the people who are really owning and driving self-determination theory. I feel privileged to be in a position to be shepherding any of that. And since uh, Ed is fully retired, and you know, I'm not that far behind him <laughs> in that regard. I'm glad that there's this community of younger scholars that are ready to take the reins and the leadership over using this framework in the ways that it can be used. So that's my hope for the theory over time. The Center for Self-Determination Theory is the mainstay that keeps all of those scholars networked together. And part of what I want to do is make, just make sure that's still able to function over time, uh, which it's clearly going to be able to do. Well, and I thought I'd end on this question. As I was doing my research to prepare, I was happy to see that one of the interviews you did was with my friend, Scott Barry Kaufman. Oh, yeah. And I can't think about Scott without thinking about Maslow. So mm -hmm. what is the correlation between SDT and self-actualization? First of all, I have a lot of respect for Abe Maslow. He was a forerunner in, in the field by recognizing that there were needs that went beyond physical needs and external reinforcements that had to do with the fulfillments of life. And when we think about self-actualization, we think about that true fulfillment of the human potentiality. It's just that I think SDT is a more specific vision of what that entails. We don't have a hierarchy of needs. We say that there's some basic psychological needs that really work together synergistically to produce a fulfilling life and a fulfilling engagement in the domains that you're active in. So I just think, I hope to think that we're the modern versions of some of that humanistic psychology, but with a really strong empirical base as both a constraint and a driver of our growth as a theory. So I think that's a bit of a difference. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love that, that Scott has told me is Maslow never even came up with the pyramid. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. wasn't even... Because that it's was true. a bunch of consultants from like Deloitte true. or McKenzie who put that thing together. So I love that he reframed it as a sailboat, which I think is a great analogy for it. <laughs> true enough. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Richard, if a listener wants to learn more about self-determination theory, obviously you've got your books, which I'll have in the show notes, but where would be self-determination theory central that we can send them to? The absolutely best place to find out about self-determination theory is at selfdeterminationtheory.org. So if you just spell that as one word, selfdeterminationtheory.org, that's a website where we provide a lot of the papers, the information, the theory, and lots of resources for understanding the theory and seeing where it gets applied. You can look up basically any topic on that page from education to organizations to parenting and uh, find hopefully something of interest. Yeah, and another thing that I would tell them to turn to is the first time I really found out about SDT was when I was reading Drive by Dan Pink somewhere mm -hmm. around 2009, 2010. And yeah. I know that he leveraged a lot of your research in that book as well. Yeah. No, I think there's been a few popular writers who I think really, uh, one of the sad things about me as a scientist, of course, is I'm not doing many popular books. When I write, I think it's a good uh, treatment for insomnia most of the time. <laughs> Uh, but I'm glad that there are popular writers like Dan Pink. Uh, recently, there's been a few popular books that I've really liked that are out there. So you'll see those on the website, the selfdeterminationtheory.org website. Okay. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such an honor to have you on the show. John, thanks for having me on the show. It's really nice talking with you. What a phenomenal interview that was with Dr. Richard Ryan. And I wanted to thank Richard as well as the Self-Determination Theory Organization for the honor of having him appear on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with Maria Menounos, an American television presenter, podcast host, and author. Maria hosted Extra and E! News, was a TV correspondent for the Today Show, Access Hollywood, and also recently co-hosted the Miss Universe 2023 pageant. This is a deeply personal interview that I did with Maria about her high points and low points in life and how she managed her emotions as well as her health throughout them. We have to take a lot more ownership over the healthcare situation in our 
our lives because the doctors are overwhelmed. You know your body better than anybody at the end of the day. You have to keep fighting for answers. You have to keep pushing. If something isn't feeling right, you've got to keep going and getting a new doctor if your doctor is maybe gaslighting you. And that's happened to me too. You just have to keep pushing. If the pain persists, so should you. You got to keep looking. Remember that we rise by lifting others. So share the show with those that you love. And if you know someone who's interested in understanding all things motivation, then definitely share today's episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is to share the show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can love what you listen. And until next time, go out there and become passion struck. Mm-hmm.